You're listening to The Bible Guys, a podcast where a couple of friends talk about the Bible in fun and practical ways. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> we talk all night through good morning, good morning to you. You just made so many of the Chris Darbaugh fans so happy. Oh, there's no it's Chris so Darbaugh long. fans out there. They have been fasting. Right, they, they have gone weeks without you singing this. No, two weeks? two weeks ago I sang it. Well, that's weeks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> two weeks. Because math is math, Chris. There go. <laughs> There's a little thing called an S at the end. Multiple. All right. Well, okay. hey, good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Uh, that just sounded like the Truman Show. My name is Chris. This is Jeff, and we are the Bible Guys. There we go. And whether you're listening online or watching, we are here today, and we're glad to be with you. And we're making the leap into the book of Joshua, or Judges. Judges. Yes. So we finished up Joshua. Yes. There's so much we could have covered, but we're taking the highlights. Well, there's a lot of details. And then we're jumping off into the book of Judges, and this book is yeah. one of the most frustrating books in the whole Bible. It really is, because it's just about, uh, it's like the worst it's part humanity. of being a pastor. Yeah, well, it's just, it's humanity over and over and over and over right, and over again. But right. hey, we'll get into that in a minute. Yeah. Anyways. Well, hey, uh, we're going to do something we've never done before. This segment is sounds like a brand new one. And Desiree is calling it Wrong Answers Only. Wrong Answers Only. Let, let me read how, because uh, mine's written slightly different than yours. Okay. It says, Chris is going to ask Jeff five random questions, and Jeff is going to respond with intentionally incorrect answers. <laughs> for example, how do you cook a steak? And then Jeff would say something like, put it in a microwave for 30 seconds. And so the goal is, let's see how off the wall Jeff can be. Okay. Yeah, uh, hey, have you ever played that game um, that escalated quickly? No, I've never. No, had. it's a table game that's similar to this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really fun. Okay, uh, that's fun. And by the way, I've not thought about a single question, and you've not thought about a single answer. Just certainly not. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm literally going to okay. just shoot from the hip. And I just have to think of the most off the wall answer. Yes. Well, this is a lot of pressure. Yes. I okay. feel uncomfortable with this. One. All right. So here we go. So um, thanks, Desiree. What is the best thing to compliment peanut butter on a sandwich? Uh, sardines. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. That's, yeah, yeah. You yeah. did that very quickly. That's good. Yeah, mm-hmm. peanut butter and sardines. Peanut butter and sardines. Actually, the salty with the salty and sweet might be good. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. So, anyway. so okay, all right. But I'm not a sardine guy. I, I'll so. give it to you. Okay. All right. So, um, how do you how do you change a flat tire? Uh, I call somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I call my mom. <laughs> there you go. That's better. That's better. I call hey, mom. my mom. <laughs> How old is your mom? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not allowed to say. She's oh, 21. Okay, she's 21. <laughs> That's so funny. All right. uh, my mom would kill me yeah. if I said her age. On really? The, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, I all would right. be That's executed. Funny. All right. So how about this one? Um, uh, what is the best anniversary gift to buy your wife? Uh, a, a scale. Oh, <laughs> Wow. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty, yeah. That's scale pretty would be, extreme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she'd be really appreciative. Yeah, I'm sure. One of those ones that sends right to your phone so she can just kind of keep track. <laughs> All right. That's good. Yeah. All right. How about this Bluetooth. one? Bluetooth. Um, uh, what is uh, the most polite thing that you can do while in India? <laughs> the most polite thing to do in India? Yeah, culturally. Uh, start sweeping the streets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, that's really funny <laughs> if you've been to India. It's really funny because there's trash everywhere yeah, yeah, in the streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. I got one oh, more. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. It's really bad. Yeah. yeah. And you could have gone a lot of different ways on that one. All right. Number five. Here I was going to say make a hamburger, but that would be super inappropriate. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about this one? Ready? Uh, what's your favorite part of being a pastor? Uh, all the kind statements that are made. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, my favorite part uh, of being a pastor, power. Yeah. <laughs> Dictatorial power. There That's you it. Go. That's I'm, in it, I'm in it to get rich and be powerful. That's there you the... go. <laughs> and feeling important. That's right. Darn That's it. Right. That's right. That's so great. Oh, that was a different type of game. Yeah, it? that was hard. Yeah, it was hard. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, as I was asking the questions, I was feeling for you. Uh-huh. But you came up with good answers. Good job. Okay. All right. So okay. Wrong answers right. only. I'm, I'm okay. All okay. Right. Okay. That's, that's All, right. All right. Colombo. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at the yeah. beginning of uh, Princess Bride. Princess Bride. Yeah. Yeah. He's looking for yeah, his yeah, glasses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's me when we're traveling. Yeah. I just 
I put things in pockets, but I forget which pocket. Yeah. So then I stand up and I'm like patting all the time. Okay. All right. And, and I've gotten to the point now, and you know, you're getting old when you do this, when you stand up and go, oh, when you stand up. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then, so you go, oh, when you stand up and you go, okay, all right, do I have everything and you pack yeah. your pockets and stuff that's. That's how I feel the all way, the time now. By the way, Peter Falk's uh, Columbus' real name is Peter Falk. Peter Falk, yeah. And they filmed a movie in Youngstown back in the seventies. Wow. Uh, he was. It was called All the Marbles. It was not a great movie. I do not recommend watching it. However, uh, I mention it only because um, they went to Idora Park, uh -huh. and Idora Park was an amusement park in Youngstown, which you would never expect there to be an amusement park in Youngstown. Right. But for a long time, it was very, very, very popular. Went from like the eight, late 1800s to something like this. Well, my brother Jim is obsessed with the history of Idora Park. And we, we used to go as kids. And then it burned down in the 80s. And then they closed it down and everything else. Well, in Youngstown today, when you go in for the Canfield Fair, there's always a remnant under a tent of all these cool memorabilia of, of, of um, Idora Park stuff. Well, apparently, somebody had auctioned off. There was a great big fire. Somebody had auctioned off the remnants of the carousel that obviously was like oh, the uh -huh. feature of the park. Right. And some lady bought it and she spent $11 million restoring it, like literally scraping off wow. each horse wow. by itself, then repainting it. And then they put it up in New York, in Brooklyn, New York. And it's in a big glass cage now. That was an old uh, Youngstown uh, Idora Park oh. carousel. So now it's, it's, it's. Did you get to see it when you were in New York? We wrote it. You wrote it. So we took the ferry all the way uh. over to Brooklyn just to ride it. And they have a special book from Youngstown that only people from Youngstown can sign. Oh, cool. So they brought it out. We, we signed it. And my father, who's 85, hasn't ridden this in like 60 years. Yeah, right? how cool. And he says, and so we're standing there in line. My brother Jim knows everything there is to know about this, this carousel. And, um, and my father says, okay, I get the Palomino. And my brother says, what do you mean? Because we were first in line. We got there a little oh. bit late. And, and, and my dad says, well, there's only two Palominos. And I always ride the Palominos. And so my brother Jim, of course, you know, looks around. He goes, oh, my goodness. He's right. There's only two Palominos. <laughs> and my dad says, yes, that's what I ride. So the gate opens. My dad runs over, sits down on this Palomino. And he leans over to the horse and he goes, I remember you. <laughs> You're such a good boy. You're a good Palomino. <laughs> That's awesome. It was hilarious. That's great. There you go. Bonus material right there. There you go. That was worth every penny. All because of Peter Falk. There you go. Because of Peter Falk. Yep. <clears throat> okay. All right. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, we're in Judges now. And here yeah. is the theme. We are going to read, I don't know, 15 verses or something. And what you're going to discover is... It's, this is the theme of the whole rest of the book. We could just read these few verses and be done with the book. Yes, because it's the same over and over again. Yes. Which is why we described it as humanity. That's right. So God says to the people, uh, hey, you need to be running the, you know, you need to continue to finish the job that Joshua didn't quite finish yet. Drive out the rest of the people, obey me. If you don't, they're always going to be a problem to you. So the people of Israel, they settle down now. They've got their homes. They've got their, their vineyards. They have their, uh, you know, um, uh, olive groves. They've got everything. And they just kind of settle down and they don't want to keep pushing. They don't want to keep fighting. So they leave all these pagans in their country. And then they start getting tempted to live like the pagans live. And so here's what happens. In Judges chapter 2, it says, After that generation died... Another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he'd done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them, and they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. This made the Lord burn with anger against Israel, so he handed them over to raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to their enemies all around, and they were no longer able to resist them. Every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated, just as he had warned, and the people were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. Yet Israel did not listen to the judges, but prostituted themselves by worshiping other gods. How quickly they turned away from the path of their ancestors who'd walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge over Israel, he was with that judge and rescued the people from their enemies throughout the judge's lifetime. 
For the Lord took pity on his people who were burdened by oppression and suffering. But when the judge died, the people returned to their corrupt ways, behaving worse than those who had lived before them. They went after other gods, serving and worshiping them, and they refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel. He said, because these people have violated my covenant, which I made with their ancestors and have ignored my commands, I will no longer drive out the nations uh, that Joshua left unconquered when he died. I did this to test Israel, to see whether or not they would follow the ways of the Lord as their ancestors did. That's why the Lord left those nations in place. He did not quickly drive them out or allow Joshua to conquer them all. So there you go. There you go. That's my yes. favorite signature phrase. Yes, that is it. And mine is, by the way. By the way. Yeah, I always say, by the way. I always say, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, it is interesting how, um, you know, if we try to learn something from this in our own lives, it is um, that life lessons do get lost between generations. Right? Don't you? Wouldn't you agree with that? That's correct. So it's it's uh you know we 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 always seem to make the mistake for somebody to have a godly legacy to carry on from generation to generation to generation. Uh, have, don't don't you find that that's actually pretty difficult? Yes. You know, for a family to say, "Oh, my grandfather served the Lord, my father served the Lord, and I've served the Lord." It's a pretty rare thing, I think. Yeah. And I think that um, I think that sometimes you rebel against. I think it's the humanity, like you said to rebel against your parents' nature. And when you grow up and sometimes you're in a pastor's, you know, household, that's why I used to fear so badly my kids growing up as a PK, as they refer to them to. Yeah. Pastor's kid. Pastor's kid. Because um, I, I just thought to myself, geez, the last thing I want is to have kids that rebel against God, rebel against church, hate church, don't want to go to church. And uh, man, it was a big fearful, you know, thing for me. Yeah. And so thank God. Yeah, it's that a hard. All three of our kids want to go to church and love God. Yeah, it's a hard thing for kids to, you know, be pastors. Kids, they grew up in a fishbowl. Yeah, everybody knows them. I remember David, my middle son, was ten years old. We grocery store everywhere we go, everywhere we went that day, somebody stopped me and wanted to talk to me. Um, and then it, it had happened over the course of, you know, a few weeks. We were up in Mackinac, and somebody stops me in a store in Mackinac on Mackinac Island. We're out riding bicycles and people turn around and come back and catch us and want to stop and talk, right? So it was just one of those kind of, it was like a month of that. Every place we went, somebody stopped us. So we're in a grocery store. Finally, somebody stops me. And when it was all done, my middle son says, dad, are we famous? Yeah. And I made a joke to him and his older brother. I said, hey, everywhere we go, somebody knows us and everybody's watching you. And that was a mistake, Mm. right? I was trying to make a joke. You better be good, right? right? That's a but they took it the other way, right? right? That there's, a, that there's a, a level that they have to live at a higher level than everybody else and all of their friends because there's always somebody trying to bust them. That's how they took it, right? They're always, that's that age, you know, you're 10, 12 years old. Everybody's, mm-hmm. everybody's after, after 10 and 12 year old boys, uh, bust them, right? You're in trouble, right? Yeah. That kind of thing. And it was hard, you know, so I had to come back and, and, and kind of backpedal from that mm-hmm. statement over the next few months, go, hey, no, I was, I was just joking, right? But they felt the pressure of that for sure. Yeah, you know, um, I I don't think I ever made those kind of uh, comments to my kids because, you know, when I went into ministry, I was fearful of two things. Do you, uh, do you remember the average length of stay that a pastor usually is at a church before they move on? Yeah, just under five years. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe it was a youth pastor stat when I when I when I was entering into ministry as a youth pastor. Yeah, it's eighteen the, months. It was eighteen months. Yeah. The average, and I thought to myself, I can't even imagine moving to a city, having my kids start to have friends, and then all of a sudden, you know, for some reason, because of my job, I'm going to move to another city, and, and just uproot my kids. And and because I'm the opposite of that, I'm wired the opposite of that. Uh, and by the way, I've only lived in two homes. I've been a pastor for 32 years, and uh, and I was in one home in Atlanta for 10 and a half years, and I'm in this home that I'm living in for 20 years. So that's good. But I didn't want to go into ministry because I didn't want to move my kids around and because I was so fearful of my kids hating God in church because they were PKs. Yeah. I, I just, I just, everything about my home. So, so along these lines, this passage, it's natural for kids to push back against how they were raised, right? Yes. yes. And so this is why in Deuteronomy, the passage we read in Deuteronomy 6, Teach them when you're walking along the way. Teach mm-hmm. them when you sit down at, at dinner. Teach them when they're going to bed at night, when they wake up in the morning, right? Just make it 
always. And then, you know, Joshua, we read the other day, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He, mm-hmm. he just made it a point. You have to really focus on passing on the the biblical truths and the the, the biblical values that you have because it's easy to drift. And all the time, it was one generation. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think about this, though, in, in human nature, when... Um, uh, uh, our founding fathers here in America, they're in Philadelphia, and they come out and, uh, hey, Mr. Franklin, what have you given us? He said, we've given you a republic if you can keep it. Right. Right? Uh, Reagan reminded us it's every single generation has to fight for freedom. Right? Mm-hmm. Because we forget. We, we every, so uh, you, you've seen probably, it's been on social media quite a bit, but it talks about strong men make good times. Mm. Right? Good times make weak men. Weak men make bad times, oh. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that, that, there, there's a truth to that, right? When you have to fight for a thing, uh, you know, our World War II generation, man, they stood for freedom because they saw that we almost lost it. And now, you know, Philadelphia this couple, last week, you had uh, hundreds of people marching through the streets of Philadelphia with communist flags in a parade. Yeah. Communist flags. I'm, yeah. I'm not talking about the, literally communist, uh, you know, hammer and sickle flags mm-hmm. uh, in on the streets where they gave us a republic, right? And, and, and no, that they desecrated the Liberty Bell. It, it, well, that was that desecration was in uh, it, it was a, a model bell in Washington D.C. It wasn't in. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. I just yeah, saw yeah, it on yeah, social media. Yeah. I, th- I assumed it was the Liberty yeah, Bell. Yeah, no, it was that. That was at the train station in. Uh, in Washington, okay. D.C. But anyways, the, the idea being, you know, a generation that doesn't have to fight for freedom tends to give freedom away. The generation that has to fight for freedom tends to hang on to it dearly and loves it, right? Mm. And then the generation that lives in between, we just kind of take it for granted and we forget and we don't pass on to the next generation how incredibly important freedom was because it's just a natural thing we deserve. We've always had it, mm. right? You have to hang on. And it's kind of the same thing with regard to faith. If we would think of the same thing for, for, for in our faith, you know, if you grew up around faith, you grew up in a family that, yeah, we go to church Christmas and Easter, most of the time what happens is we inoculate our children from real faith. We mm-hmm. give them just enough Jesus, just enough Bible, just enough church that we inoculate them from the real thing, right? And But the person who lived an, a, a godless life and then God rescues them, and they feel the power of being forgiven and the power of God's grace and mercy. And they've lived out the transformation that God, they tend to be all in, whatever it takes. You know, that was my dad. My, di- my dad lived like a pagan for 40 years. And then he, he became a, a believer when he was 40 years old. Jesus transformed him. And my dad jumped in with both feet. He was all in, right? And he worked so hard to pass that on to the rest of us. And thank God he did. But now I wonder, have I passed it on as strongly to my children as my dad passed on to us, mm-hmm. right? And then what about my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren? It's just a natural fade. Every generation has to work very hard to make God and the things of God center instead mm-hmm. of a part of our life. And what they did is they, the one generation dies, the next generation goes, hey, this is pretty great. Well, let's be honest. There's a, there's a comparison here in the Life Application Study Bible mm-hmm. between worshiping God and worshiping idols. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah talk about that for a minute. Cause this is, it, there's no wonder they switched over. If yeah. you forget how great God was and how God worked so hard to rescue you and you start looking at the benefits of this other worship system, you go, Hey, that yeah. looks like fun. So, so, so the left side of the column says the benefits of worshiping God. And then the uh, right column is worshiping idols. So it's sort of like the good versus the bad, right? God versus the idols. Right. So it says long range benefits versus short range benefits. Gratification postponed versus self-gratification immediate. Uh, Morality required versus sensuality engaged or encouraged. Uh, uh, High ethical standards demanded versus low ethical standards tolerated. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, Neighbor's sins disapproved versus neighbor's sins approved. Unseen God worshipped versus visible idols worshipped. There's something to that. Uh, Unselfishness expected versus selfishness condoned. Um, uh, business relations hindered versus business relations improved strict religious practices maintained versus religious practices loosely regulated changed life demanded versus changed life not demanded ethical stand uh, expected versus compromise and cooperation practiced and then finally it says concern for others taught 
versus no concern for others expected. Yeah. And if you think about it, it really is true. So whether it's a false physical idol or whether it's just something else that takes the priority of God, not not a physical thing, but a priority thing, um, it's completely true. Well, in the West, our gods are typically are not statues that we put up and pray to. Right. Our gods now is uh, our God is humanism. Mm -hmm. We we, we worship humanity. We worship ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And what we want and what we think is fair and good and right. And so what you see here is worshiping God is there's this moral ethical standard based on what God says he will and will not bless. Right. Mm -hmm. What's cursed and what's blessed and do these things and I'll bless you. And there's some restrictions to our life because God says, hey, this is the better life. You're not going to have as many sexual disease. You're not going to have sexual sexually transmitted diseases if you're faithful to your spouse and you're not sleeping with other people that aren't are you're not married to, right? Uh, you're not going to have cirrhosis of the liver more than likely if you're not drinking yourself to sleep every night, right? God gives all these guidelines, and you live that life, you're going to be better. And if you reject Him, you're going to have all these other things. But worshiping idols was pure humanism and pure hedonism. It's just pure pleasure. Do whatever you want to do, right? Right, and so here you go. Now this generation, they weren't with God when, uh, with the people of God, when God separated the 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 Red Sea, and so now there's probably some apologists going, that didn't really happen. That's just a that, that's an old wives' tale, right? That didn't really happen. And then, oh God, you know they weren't there when God tore down the walls of Jericho, and so now there's uh, you know people on the news going, really, I, I think I think that was just a thing my grandma used to talk about, right? Yeah. So, but instead now you're going to worship some God you can't see. That's silly. Look at this God. And by the way, we get to have sex in the temple. How great is that? Mm-hmm. Right? You get to do whatever you want to do. And so they began to look at the what they viewed as an unseen God with old wives' tales that grandma and grandpa were talking about versus look at all the fun that is totally saturated our culture. And God said the consequence that this had happened because you didn't drive out all the people. I allowed you to not drive out all the people as a test, and you didn't pass the test. Instead, you're just diving in, living the culture. And I, and I think about that a lot. I think that even for the Christians who you know, attend church on Sundays, most Christians I know have dived in headfirst into the world mm. and, the, and the world culture. Humanism and, and hedonism tend to go far beyond. Shoot, most people know more about the, our culture than they know about the Bible. Even yeah. the people who go to church all the time. Yeah, that's definitely right? true. And so we fade from those. Um, So it says that uh, in the Life Application Study Bible that throughout this stage of history, Israel went through seven cycles. (laughs) Number one, rebelling against God. Number two, being overrun by enemy nations. Number three, being delivered by a God-fearing judge. Number four, remaining loyal to God under that judge. And then number five, uh, uh, again, forgetting uh, (laughs) God and the judge who died, we tend to follow the same cycle, remaining loyal to God as long as we are near those who are devoted to him. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting how that really is truly the entire book of Judges. Right. And God sends a new judge, then a new judge, then a new judge. Uh, How many judges are there in the book of Judges? There's Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, and Samson. So 12. And then, and then, and then, I think you can call um, Samuel a judge. Oh, okay, right. So Samuel was the last of the judges. So I think okay. that's that's what you have. So so so, uh, so yeah, so thirteen. Um, isn't it funny how when you were reading through those, did your brain go toward uh, how many sermons have I heard on? Like, like I've heard definitely sermons on Deborah. Yeah, I've heard them on Gideon. Um, I've heard them on mm, Shamgar. Samson. You've huh? heard them on Shamgar. Shamgar? Have yeah. I heard sermons? Yeah, he, he, he was out. It only, there's only two verses. He was out in a field, and he killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and it said uh, uh, he, he did what he could where he was with what he had. You ever hear that message? No. No, that was a I've great never message. Heard, I've never heard a, oh, yeah. a sermon on Shamgar. You well, then maybe we'll do have. Shamgar. Yeah. Yeah, I've preached on all of them. Well, no, not, not Tola. You've done a series on the judges? Yeah. Wow. Remember Jephthah? Jephthah's the one that made the promise. Oh, no, I, I remember them. Oh, I yeah. remember reading mm-hmm. them. I'm just saying sermons I've heard Yeah, probably. from other people. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, the Abdon one was funny. I preached that on a, uh, a challenge. People choosing obscure verses and asking to preach, right? 
Oh, and really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a preacher boy challenge. Yeah. Just here's a weird verse, preach this message. And so, yeah, it, there's only three verses yeah. about Abdon. He's got uh, 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode donkeys. And so I just preached a message about having a bunch of kids and riding donkeys. Oh, my yeah. goodness gracious. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Wow. All right. Well, hey, listen, that is our time. So uh, we will see you next time on The Bible Guys.